Well, good evening. Thank you for joining me again this evening for our study of Paul's letter to the Romans. Or if you're joining me on Sunday morning, good morning. Thank you for joining me for Paul's letter, the study of Paul's letter to the Romans. I'm doing this live on Wednesday night, December 9th, and it is nice and chilly outside, hence the sweater. I said last week that when uh, I see myself looking very uh, much like the rumpled professor, I am not. Anyway, I said last week that when it gets under 75, everybody maybe puts on our sweater. And probably we only have one. Well, some of us have a couple, maybe from years gone by, living up north. So I put on my other sweater this evening and trying to tell myself I enjoy the change of temperatures. I really don't. I don't like cold weather. It's one of the reasons I moved to South Florida all those years ago and have stayed here. But if this is as bad as it gets, I will not whine. I've got children who live up north where it does get really cold and they would laugh if they knew that I was complaining about it being down in the 50s or even high 40s here. So enough weather report. Thanks for joining me Wednesday evening or Sunday morning. This will be the final session of our study of Paul's letter to the Romans chapters 1 through 8. I started this I believe the first Wednesday in June because we felt like we needed a Wednesday evening study that we could do online because we weren't sure when we'd be able to get back together again live and in person and so started it then really thinking I'd run it through the summer and here we are coming up on mid-December and we're still somewhat quarantined and isolated we're, uh, we're meeting Sunday mornings together for worship and we'll continue doing that but short of that, we're not doing a whole lot live and together. So, anyway, glad we started this study together. And tonight we'll wrap up chapters 1 through 8. And I don't think I'm going to, in fact, I'm sure I'm not going to pick it up with chapter 9 next semester. Uh, I may resume it next year. I don't know. But this will wrap up our study of chapters 1 through 8. And I want to say again, I hope this has been a fraction as rewarding and productive for you as it has been for me. And, and I know this gets very repetitive, but I've read and studied and even taught Paul's letter to the Romans many, many times. And I still realize new depths of it every time I study it and teach it again. The teacher always learns the most. Your teachers know that. And this has been the deepest dive I've ever done into it. And it's been very, very rewarding for me. I hope it has been for you. Those of you who've been with me, from the beginning, even if you haven't made every single one, thank you for doing this and investing part of an hour in studying God's letter, God's word, and Paul's letter to the Romans. So, with enough preamble, let me ask God's blessing, and then we'll get into the study. Would you pray along with me? Father, I thank you once again for your word. Your word is truth. And I would echo Jesus' prayer for us, sanctify us in the truth. Set us apart for your purposes and for your services. And Lord, if this study of Romans has helped move that along, even a little tiny bit, in the lives of my brothers and sisters in Christ, I am well pleased. So Lord, again, work in our lives, in our hearts, our minds, our wills, our hands and our feet, our relationships, our attitudes, our thoughts, our words, Lord, down into our very souls. Use this study of your word in Paul's letter to the Romans to move us closer to what you want us to be and more conform to the image of your son Jesus, the living word, in whose name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, here we go. Paul's letter to the Romans tonight, chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. <clears throat> excuse me, the last, <clears throat> excuse me, nine verses of Paul's letter. And I'll just remind you again by review, I've called this the letter that changed the world. The theme of the letter is justification by faith alone. We are made right, justified before the Lord by faith, period, not works. It's not faith plus works equal justification. It is that faith 
equals justification plus works. I had this conversation with some good friends this morning, trying to wrap our minds around, well, what are the, what, what's the point of doing works? Well, if we if we're made right in God's sight, why don't we just sit on the couch and do nothing or go out and live like crazy? Well, Paul addresses that in this letter, doesn't he? What then shall we say? Shall we sin the more that grace may abound? And Paul says, in rather strong language, no, may it never be. If we're made right in God's sight by faith alone, and then that faith that has made us right is to yield into yield good works, yield our obedience, our discipleship in Christ. So that's the theme, justification by faith alone. Here's the outline we've been following. <clears throat> Excuse me. After the introduction and the statement of the theme, the one who's righteous by faith shall live. The rest of chapter 1 through the end of chapter 4, we looked at what it means, the one who is righteous by faith, Paul's description of that person. And then in chapter 5, on through the, all here the end of chapter 8, he has exposited or expounded upon what it means to live. How shall that person live? If we ever get to the rest of Paul's letter to the Romans, then you'll see that 9, 10, 11, he deals with what happens with Israel. Somebody has told me that they think I'm just ducking out of that because I don't want to talk about the controversial parts of this. I'd be happy to, but it won't be in the next six months. Sorry, if, the, if I hear a, a, a public cry of, no, please, Pastor Gant, you must teach Romans 9, 10, 11, you must teach the rest of Romans. If I hear that, then, then you know, maybe move that timetable up some, but not, not right away. Then the response to the mercies of God, practical applications, and final greetings. And now we get to our text for the evening, Romans 8, 31 through 39. Paul writes, <clears throat> excuse me again, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What then, what shall we say to these things, Paul writes, uh, J.B. Phillips, very free translation of the New Testament. It's been out probably 40 years, gosh, more than that, maybe 50 years now, something like that. J.B. Phillips uh, has Paul saying at this point, what is there left to say? What more can I say about this? And then Paul must, likes to pose his own questions and then answer them. He ain't, he's written this letter as though there's somebody across the table from him or across the room from him raising objections all the way through. And I will tell you that as I've been teaching this study to a group of men on Wednesday mornings, we're about four chapters behind, four and a half chapters behind where we are now. My brother on Wednesday morning raised the exact same objections that Paul has his, I guess, imaginary questioner, the fancy seminary term for that if you want is interlocutor. I expect you to work that into conversations from now tomorrow. Well, you know, uh, let me just say, if you were my interlocutor on this particular matter, I would say, Paul presumes or imagines, poses as if there's a questioner asking him questions, raising objections, 
And he goes on to answer them. What then shall we say to these things? What more is there to say? What is left to say? And then Paul says, well, since you asked, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of things left to say. Uh, he says, Paul says, who will, uh, who will separate us from the love of uh, God in Christ? Well, Paul says, uh, since you asked, there are a lot of people and things that would separate us from the love of Christ, wouldn't there? There are other people. Remember, as he's writing these words, somewhere around 57, 58 AD, he is writing from Corinth, the winter of 57 going in 58 of AD, uh, 57, 58 AD. He's writing from Corinth to people in Rome, his Jewish friends, and he hasn't met them, along with some Gentiles. Who, is, who will separate us from the love of God in Christ? Well, Paul said, they would say, well, how, about, how about the Jewish authorities? They don't take kindly to our saying that Jesus is Messiah. How about the Roman authorities? The Roman establishment. They don't take kindly to us saying Jesus is Lord. They want us to say Caesar is Lord. How about the lions in the Colosseum, Paul? They would like to separate us from the love of God in Christ. If God is for us, who is against us? They're all against us. That's who. And so those who've read his letter to the Ephesians go on to say, what about those, those, those world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places that you warn the Ephesians about? Is that, is that enough? Is that enough opposition, Paul? Is that, is that enough for you to is that enough for you to to consider that's that's who is for, who is against us, even though God is for us? Paul says, yeah, yeah. And it's not like he doesn't know. It's not like Paul is writing this from some ivory tower someplace where where he's never or or some academic office where he's never confronted these things. Remember what Paul went through. If you want to read it, I'm not going to read it to you again. I have before. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and Paul lists out the litany of his sufferings. Again, the, the floggings, the beatings with rods, the, the being run out of town, being called everything but a child of God, shipwrecks, a stoning, which once more was not a reprimand. It was not a punishment. Stoning was first century Electric chair stuff. You don't walk away from a stoning. Yet you know, Paul had all these things he's been through. So when Paul poses these 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 questions to the to the people in Rome, if God is for us, who is against us? It's not like he doesn't know. It's not like what Shakespeare has Romeo say to his friend Mercutio, he jests at scars that never felt a wound. He just at scars that never felt a wound. How about that? I thought a little Shakespeare. You, know, you don't get this. You don't get this from your average Pentecostal pastor. I'm just saying. You don't get this in Jerry Reed's classes either. My good friend, Dr. Reed, doesn't ever let one of his classes go by without taking a shot or two or 12 at me. So I'm just returning a little friendly fire. You don't hear, you don't hear Dr. Reed quoting Shakespeare. You can tell him I said that. So it's it's not Paul's not like that. He's not one of those guys that that just the scars because he's never felt the wound. He's probably felt as many wounds, he's had as many scars as everybody in Rome that he's writing to. So if God is for us, who is against us? Well, that's who, and Paul knows. Paul knows. He's not writing in a vacuum someplace where he doesn't understand their sufferings. If God is for us, who is against us? Well. It's a rhetorical question, really, because Paul knows, and they know who all is against them. But here's the great assurance. And I'll quote the great late Anglican rector John Scott again. All the powers of hell may set themselves together against us, but they can never prevail since God is on our side. And I think what Paul writes here in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, and again, just a reminder, Paul doesn't write in chapters and verses. That was done for us many, many centuries later by a monk or two, which I'm, I appreciate them doing it. Paul is just writing a stream of thought here, dictating it to his secretary, writing, writing these things down. 
And what he comes out with here are some of the most comforting words in all of Romans, some of the most comforting words in all Paul's writings, all 13 letters that Paul wrote, some of the most comforting in all the New Testament, some of the most comforting in all of the Bible. I have lost track of how many times I have read or recited these very words at or beside someone's sick bed, someone's hospital bed, said these words to somebody who we weren't sure if the person was hearing us any longer, but we wanted the loved ones and I wanted to go ahead and assume that they could hear us. You've probably heard this before and I can affirm the sense of, sense of hearing is the last thing you lose before you lose consciousness or before you fade away. Uh, and so I've read these words, recited these words at more sick beds and hospital beds and death beds and at funerals and at memorial services and graveside services because they are so very comforting for God's people. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Well, here's a whole litany of people and things that can be against us, but Paul would say that one plus God is a majority. In fact, God's a majority all by himself. He doesn't need he doesn't need a one plus. But if you're on God's side, then you have the majority. So I'm not going to say it doesn't matter who is against you. It does matter. I certainly had people oppose me, people out to sort of get me, if you let me put it that way. Not physically. <clears throat> but people who are out to oppose me for things I've said, things I believe, people who thought I wasn't the right person to be in a particular position, wanted to get rid of me. I've been through some of that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna exaggerate or, or be overly dramatic about it. I've had opposition. I know. <clears throat> A sweetheart like me. Can you imagine that? Anybody would be against me. I've experienced that. Listen, if you're if you're in ministry, I think if you're a pastor of a local church, if you're in ministry at all, and you never engender any opposition, my guess is you're really not doing your job. If you never have people take offense at anything you say, I don't think you're preaching the gospel. The gospel will offend. We don't have to be offensive. We don't have to be abrasive. We put it in real technical theological language. We don't have to be jerks about it. Religious jerks, that's the worst kind. Jerks are bad enough, but religious jerks are the worst. Aren't we? If you never offend anybody, you're probably not preaching a, a rather pure doctrine of God's grace. And you're almost certainly not standing where the scripture tells we have to stand. If you take a biblical stance on issues today, I'm not talking about politics in terms of, of being for or against certain candidates or certain parties. I'm talking about issues, moral and ethical issues. If you never proclaim what God's Word has to say about that so that you do engender some opposition, I just, I just question whether you're truly preaching the whole counsel of God. It's not for me to say between you and God, if you're a pastor or a person in ministry of any kind. But I don't think we can make it a goal as Christians to slide through life and, and never ever offend anybody or never engender any opposition. We don't have our way to do it. If you preach the straight up gospel of God's grace and you preach the whole counsel of God, you're going to stir up some opposition. But just remember again, not that God needs our vote, but one plus God is a majority. And if God is for us, who's against us? It doesn't really matter who's against us. And then we get into verse 32, when Paul says, let me just flip back so I make sure i am got my numbers correct here. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? What Paul is saying here is, 
if he'll give his son for you, if he will actually give his son for you, he's not going to hold back on you. He'll hold back on other things. I mean, really? Yes, I'll give you my son, but no, I'm not going to give you fill in the blank. Listen, if you drop a couple hundred grand on a brand new Rolls Royce Silver Shadow, whatever they cost now, you drop a couple hundred grand on a new, brand new Rolls, you're probably not going to put factory retread tires on it. If you're going to spend like that for an automobile, you're probably going to give it the best equipment, the best features that you possibly can. That yeah, might be a shallow analogy, but if God would give you his son, if he would sacrifice his own son for us, he's going to hold out on us to give us other good things, other good blessings? I don't think so. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? You know, Paul asked that rhetorically because he knows there are plenty out there who would be glad to bring a charge against God's elect. Let's look at what John says in the in the Revelation. I almost call it the Apocalypse because that's basically the rendering of the, the Greek title for the word for the book is the Apocalypse, the Revelation. John writes Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. <clears throat> who will accuse us before God? Satan will. Let me clarify something. Satan is not like God. He is not omnipresent. He isn't everywhere. So, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, Chances are, Satan has probably never accused you or attacked you personally, ever. I could be wrong about that. But Satan is a limited being. He can only be in one place at one time. He's not like God. So if Satan's going to be out there opposing somebody, Satan's going to be out there attacking somebody, if he's going to be out there accusing somebody, it's probably not little old me or you. He'll go after some big gun. You go after somebody that's really out there knocking the ball out of the park, changing the world for Christ. Would have been Billy Graham. Maybe it's now, now it's Luis Palau. I don't know. But he's probably not after you personally. However, the forces of darkness, those spiritual forces in the heavenly places that Paul wrote about in Ephesians 6, Satan's got plenty of help. He's got plenty of little helpers. And he's happy to have them do his dirty work for him to accuse you. So, who will bring a charge against God's elect? A lot of people will, Paul. A lot of people will. And again, it's not like he doesn't know that. Paul's been accused of everything, everything possible from the time he started in uh, preaching the gospel. He's been accused by his fellow Jews. He's been accused by the Gentiles. He's been accused by the Romans. He's been accused by everybody and everything. So it's not as if Paul doesn't understand these things. He's raising these questions rhetorically for a reason. So Paul says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Well, Satan will. Others will. But here's Paul's point. If God says you're in the clear, if God has declared you not only not, only not guilty, you're not only declared not guilty, you are justified. You are made righteous in God's sight. It's not like in a court of law here where the judge says, well, look, I know this guy's a dirt bag. I know he's a scumbag, and I know he's guilty, but hey, hey there, uh, uh, prosecution, you didn't make your case. So I'm dismissing the charges. Or the jury says, we don't find, we don't find clear and compelling evidence beyond the reasonable shadow of a doubt, so we have to let him walk. We know he's probably guilty. Oh, Jason, excuse me. But the prosecution didn't make his case, so we got to let him go. Couldn't find him guilty. No, that's not how it is. God doesn't really look at us and say, well, all right, I'm going to say you're not guilty. The accuser of your 
soul didn't 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 make us no. He says, You have been made justified. You have been made righteous in my sight with the righteousness of Christ. That's how righteous you are. And so if God declares that <clears throat> to be the case, if God says you're in the clear, if God says you're actually made righteous in his sight, who's there to say otherwise? Who's going to say, well, I don't think so, God? Well, really? Well, your little opinion doesn't really matter much. There's a story I love about the great Babe Ruth when he was at the height of his fame, the height of his baseball prowess. Most famous sports figure in all the world. He's the most famous person, uh, in, probably in America at that point. In fact, there's a great story about how uh, somebody traded a Babe Ruth baseball card uh, for two cards that had the uh, likeness of President Herbert Hoover on it. And somebody said, "How did? Why, why was somebody trade one Babe Ruth for two Herbert Hoovers?" And Ruth said. I had a better year than he did. I digress. There's a great story about, I'm digressing from a digression. Great story about Babe Ruth. He's at the bat, and the umpire's name was also Babe, Babe Pirelli. And Babe Pirelli called Babe Ruth out looking on a called third strike. Nobody called Babe Ruth out on a called third strike. That just didn't happen. But Babe Pirelli said, you're out. And... Everybody in the stands is booing because they don't want to see Babe Ruth strike out looking. They don't want to see him hit another home run. And as people are booing, Babe Ruth turns around and says to Babe Pirelli, in slightly more colorful language than this, Bad call, meathead. There's 40,000 people in the stands here. They all knew that you blew that call. That, was, that, wasn't, a, that wasn't a strike. And Pirelli walked around the plate, turned around, turned his back to the crowd and started brushing on the plate and said, maybe so, Mr. Ruth, but mine is the only opinion that matters. Have a seat. What's that got to do with anything? I don't know. I just love that story. Everybody in the world, everything in the universe may accuse you of being guilty of all manner of evil. Everybody may know you're guilty. And God says, maybe so, but mine is the only opinion that matters. You're innocent. You are not only innocent, you are made righteous in my sight. Anybody else got anything to say about that? I don't think so. And here, Paul, I'm convinced, did his doctoral dissertation on Isaiah because he is steeped in, immersed in, Isaiah's prophecy, all six chapters of it. Here's what Paul I, I'm, Paul is referring to as he writes this in, uh, in Gaius' house in Corinth, as he writes to the people in Rome. He is echoing Isaiah chapter 50, verses 7 through 9, the first part of 9. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? If you notice that the means there is capitalized, that's because this is about the suffering servant of Isaiah. And Paul here is echoing the language of the suffering servant of Isaiah, the messianic figure. Paul is echoing that language and <clears throat> putting himself, putting us in the place of the Messiah, the suffering servant, because we've been given his righteousness. That's how righteous we are in God's sight. Verses 35 through 39, and he answers this question. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, everything Paul lists here in these verses is external. There are external things coming against us. Paul says, none of those things can serve us from the love of God. But then he says, nor anything else in all creation. The externals and the internals, 
Nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing without, nothing within, nothing. Because God has declared it to be so. He said, we're persecuted for your sake. Understand, persecuted for your sake, Lord. Suffering does not mean you are out of God's will. Suffering does not mean you have done something and God is not out to get you. I know, I know, I really do. I understand that when you're going through a really rough time, everything in you wants to look up and echo like Job. Why me, God? What did I do? Why are you allowing this or causing this to happen to me? What did I do, Lord, to deserve this? And the answer may very well be, now look, maybe you did do something, okay? To echo a simple illustration or, or analogy that I've used many times, if you get ripping drunk, it's a technical term, ripping drunk, and you decide that you're going to drive your car at 75 or 85 miles per hour the wrong way up I-95 or the turnpike, and you get into a head-on collision, and you are so badly banged up that there's less of you that's intact than is broken, you don't have to lie there in your hospital bed in a body cast from head to toe with tubes coming out of every conceivable portion of your body and say, why me, God? Why are you punishing me? No, you did it to yourself, bonehead. You got drunk and drove the wrong way. You probably hurt other people at the same time. Sometimes we do cause our own sufferings. But if you're suffering from something and you had nothing to do with it, it's totally beyond your control, then the temptation is to say, well, God, you must be doing this to me. And the simple answer may very well be, you may not have done anything wrong. The fact that we are suffering does not indicate that God is punishing us. At least not for anything we've done. Jesus was punished. Wasn't, he didn't do anything wrong. The sufferings that Paul went through. Wasn't he doing anything wrong? He's doing everything right. I like something that John Stott says here again. So let me refer to what the late great John Stott said. Paul seems to be saying that since Christ proved his love for us by his sufferings, so our sufferings cannot possibly separate us from it. Let me read that again a little more clearly. Paul seems to be saying that since Christ proved his love for us by his sufferings, so our sufferings cannot possibly separate us from it. Jesus suffered for us and demonstrated his love for us. And while we were sinners, he died for us. So the fact that we are suffering doesn't mean that somehow that means we've been separated from his love. No. In fact, the New Testament is pretty clear that part of being a Christian is entering into the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Paul and some of the other writers, especially Peter, they consider it an honor to suffer for Christ. If you read what happens with the apostles in Acts 4 and 5 especially, where they're called before the authorities and they're told, you better shut up, stop talking about this Jesus or else. And they say, well, we're not going to, so do your worst. And they do. Well, they don't do their worst, not yet. <clears throat> they arrest them, they beat them, they flog them, they throw them in prison. And the apostles counted an honor they kind of a joy to be kind of worthy to suffer for Christ. I got to tell you, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm not there. When I suffer, maybe it is for the gospel, maybe it's not. I don't, I don't count it a real honor. Not one I won anyway. Someone else can have that honor. I don't count it a joy, not yet. If you do, then God bless you. You're way farther down that road than I am. I start suffering, I just want it to end. I just want it over with. When my loved ones suffer, I especially want it over with for them. But the New Testament writers make it clear that that suffering may mean God has counted you worthy to enter into the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. 
we must remember, and we forget this because for the most part, <clears throat> we 20th, now 21st century Western, especially here in this country, we've had a pretty easy ride most of our lives. But the Bible was written by suffering, I use the term Christians, they won't call that in the Old Testament, you know that. But the Bible was written by suffering Christians to suffering Christians. If we lose sight of that, then we don't understand the Bible. It was written by suffering people to suffering people. We need to remember that as well. So Paul is saying, according to John Stott, I'll put it back on the screen. <clears throat> Since Christ proved his love for us by his sufferings, so our sufferings cannot possibly separate us from it. I don't say this globally. I don't consider myself any kind of an expert on suffering. I know what suffering I've had. And <clears throat> sometimes it's been pretty bad. Bad enough that I would prefer almost anything to the suffering that I was in. So I don't I don't say any this glibly, especially those of you who are suffering from things that are worse than what I've been through. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe some other disease. Maybe yours is progressive and incurable. Maybe you're looking at final approach before you go to heaven. And you don't see any good days ahead. So I don't say any of this globally. I really don't. But please try to keep in, in mind from what Paul says here, who knew so much about suffering, and the other biblical writers who, who suffered so greatly. Many of them died a horrible, horrible deaths. All, tw well, of the third, of the twelve original disciples, Judas killed himself. Matthias was put in his place, and then Paul was at the thirteenth <coughs> disciple slash apostle. And please remember that minus Judas, twelve of the thirteen original apostles died horrible deaths. The only one that did it was John. He lived to be an old man. He suffered horribly in his lifetime. And he died not as a martyr, but as an old man. So when they write about suffering, they're not writing from a, from a palace someplace. They write as suffering people to suffering people. <clears throat> Our sufferings don't mean God's mad at us. <clears throat> if you don't believe me again, read the book of Job. God wasn't mad at Job. He just decided to allow Satan to test him and put him through horrible things. He never explained to Job why. Never told Job why. And at the end, he restores his fortune, sure. But he didn't restore the children that died. Job died without really understanding why he went through what he went through. He knows now. He knows now. One day we'll know. Why we suffer. Boy, I, I hang on to that. I really hang on to that. God, one day you will make these things make sense. And if that's not true, we're just deluding ourselves. And I'll say, echo Paul, and we are most people to be pitied. But I believe God will make it make sense. Now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now I know in part then I will know in full, just as I also have been fully known. I don't believe I'll know everything God knows. I won't become omniscient, but I believe I will know everything I need to know to make this life make sense. I take that as, a, as an item of faith. So, as we wrap up this beautiful, inspiring, comforting passage in the 8th chapter of Romans, there's such a sort of a relentless logic to this. Let me, uh, let me, show you a great quote from my non-cousin Tim Keller again we're not related again please remember he is now suffering from pancreatic cancer and if you aren't aware of it then let me make you aware of it the survival rates for pancreatic cancer are really low I believe I'm correct in saying it's 6 percent Tim Keller is facing that now but before he had was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer he, he wrote these words it is incredible, relentless logic, what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones called logic on fire. 
Paul says, think. Are you afraid? You aren't thinking. Are you worried? You aren't thinking. Are you feeling guilty? You aren't thinking. See the logic of free grace and justification. These aren't dry doctrines. They are life itself. If you're not living with overwhelming assurance and power, you haven't really fully understood them. I, I think I speak for all of us who say we, we struggle with that. We all struggle with it. When we're living without peace, without assurance, with doubts. And yes, I still deal with them too. I've been a pastor for as long as some of you have been alive. I've been a Christian for a lot longer than that. Yeah, I still struggle. I have doubts. I have questions. With some of the experiences and exposure I've had, I probably have some questions you never thought of. Not because I'm so smart, but because I've hung out with some pretty smart people. I've had to confront some some questions, some issues, some doubts that you probably never thought about. Yeah, I have those. But someone's put it, well, I try to live in my faith and visit my doubts, not the other way around. I try to live in my faith, visit my doubts, not the other way around. In other words, I don't live in my doubts and occasionally come up here and visit my faith like Sunday mornings. It's a choice. It's a choice I make. It's a choice you make. Where are you going to live? You have, a, you have a choice. You can live in your faith or your doubts. Where do you want to live? I think the only way to live anything that approaches a, a fulfilling life, a satisfactory life, is to live in your faith. If it's your doubts, and trust that God is big enough that one day He will explain it all to you. It may not be in this life. Probably won't. But He'll explain it one day. One day. And so we come to the end of Romans chapter 8. And I like the way, very succinct way that Dr. Douglas Moo puts it. The chapter begins with no condemnation, ends with no separation. Romans chapter 8, once, chapter 8 starts in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It ends with no condemnation, it ends with no separation. Nice little turn of a phrase there. We're not condemned by God. We're not separated from God. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. I want to end with a quote of someone I haven't quoted the entire time. I've brought some really great thinkers, speakers, writers, theologians, pastors, and so forth before you. From Tim Keller to Doug Moo to John Stott to Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, that's a mouthful, to William Hendrickson to Benjamin Harrison, uh, I say C.S. Lewis, a lot of C.S. Lewis, you're welcome. Um, uh, J.I. Packer, I brought you a lot of great thinkers and writers and, and theologians and so forth, and uh, Francis Schaeffer, and, uh, and I hope it's been worthwhile for you. And uh, I've introduced you to some people who might enrich your life. I want to end with a quote from somebody I have not quoted the entire time. It's not somebody that probably people in my end of the, uh, of the theological spectrum, the reform camp, we probably quote this guy a lot. But maybe we should, because he's a good writer, speaker, thinker, very quotable. His name is Max Lucado. Maybe you've heard of him. We are his idea. We are his. His face, his eyes, his hands, his touch. We are his. Look deeply into the face of every human being on earth, and you will see his likeness. Though some appear to be distant relatives, they are not. God has no cousins, only children. We are incredibly the body of Christ. And though we may not act like our Father, there is no greater truth than this. We are His, unalterably. He loves us undyingly. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Wherever you are, whenever you're watching this or hearing this, can I get an amen? And with that, I'll conclude this six-month deep dive into Romans chapter 1, verses through chapter 8. Again, I hope it's been productive for you. These are all on our website. If you, uh, you can access them all through our website on Facebook Live. 
Facebook recorded. If you missed any of them, you can go back and get them all. But I would wrap up this evening after quoting Max Lucado with simply giving you Aaron's blessing from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.